let's finish up. And sorry, I'm going to be sitting down. I, I really did injure my foot, and boy, it's, it doesn't bother me unless I stand for a long time. And then if I stand the next morning, it's like it's so painful. And all of that's getting transcribed for us by your Okay, so let's finish up this, this article on annuities. The rest of this article is a bunch of lists. Some lists you need to discuss some, some lists you can just do the list because they're, they're very straightforward. So we just talked, this is I think a really early key. This is the top of page six. I think a real key to this is why is an annuity so powerful? And so just really let it sink in. If you have an annuity, you can freely spend all of your money without having to worry about it. It's a huge advantage. Now, essentially, you're not spending all of your, the company is just going to keep paying you, but they're they're spending all of your money because they have a bunch of different insureds. Some will live a long time, some will die early. They're taking care of that longevity risk for you. So you take the maximum amount of your income that you possibly can, and you don't have to worry about it running out because the company is going to pay you for the rest of your life. You can't do that if, you, if it's your own money, because you always have to worry about running out of money. So... If you want to really maximize the, in, the, the most you can uh, out of the income potential of your portfolio, you've got to annuitize it. That's the maximum that you can do. Huge, huge advantage. So we talked some about the Trinity study, that 4% payoff. So decumulation. So most insurance companies are focused on accumulation because that's where they make money, which is how you build a retirement plan. Very few people will focus on decumulation. Um, annuitization of a substantial portion of retirement wealth is the best way to go. So pensions, re, uh, social security, these, these type of annuities, they provide an amazingly important portion of the retirement. For an, an annuitization was... Full annuitization was often for people who had no desire to leave a bequest for the heirs. That's kind of obvious. If you don't want to leave anything to your kids, you might as the best way you can spend your entire retirement account is just annuitize the entire thing. Um, who had no desire to leave a bequest to the heirs or charitable organization. It also included that for those with bequest motives, substantial annuitization retirement was still the most prudent way to act. We're going to talk about this idea that, wow, if you annuitize, that's money you cannot give to your heirs. We'll look, uh, we may not do it as part of this article, but later in the class, we'll, we'll see. USAA has a really good calculator and you can compare different types of annuity options and see how costly it is for you. So there is one annuity option that says, I wanna buy an annuity, but I'm worried I'm gonna buy an annuity and I'll die three weeks later. So you can do what's called 10 year certain. It says, you know what, if I die in three weeks, my heirs will at least get 10 years worth of money. Now, what's that going to do your monthly income and reduce it? How much? It kind of depends. If you're 60, it may not reduce it all that much. If you're 94, it's going to reduce it a whole lot because your chances of living 10 more years is very, very low. So we'll look at that and see what that impact is. But you might be surprised that adding a 10-year certain increases your income from $500 a month to $450 a month. You might say, well, you know what? At least I don't have that regret that, you know, I gave them a, a million dollars and then three months later I died and I didn't get much back. But you can't maximize it much more than an annuity uh, versus any other product. All right. So what do they actually recommend? So here's one of those lists. The level of annuitization that was optimal depending on what. See if any of these make any or, or any question. Wealth at retirement. If your net worth at retirement is $4 billion, do you need to annuitize your portfolio? Probably not. Do you think Bill Gates is gonna buy a, an immediate annuity? Really doesn't need to. He's got so much money. Um, what if you're in, you're, you only have 300,000? In that case, that may be your only option. You may have to do that because that's gonna give you the maximum income. So your wealth, does level security, social security, impact you. I've looked at my social security. I can probably live comfortably just off my social security. Can I use that as an argument to say, hey, I don't need an annuity. I'll just rely on social security. I live so cheaply. It's amazing. 
People say you can't live off Social Security. I can. I hate insurance at all because I'm so cheap. So maybe I don't need one. If if your living expenses are forty thousand a year and Social Security is going to pay you fifty thousand, then yeah, maybe you don't need need that. Your risk tolerance. If you're not risk tolerant, the annuity is a really sure, confident way to go. That will help you. Obviously, your bequest motive. If you want to leave more money to your heirs, an immediate annuity is going to take money away from them. That's going to be your impatience to consume. If you really want to consume today and you just can't wait, then that's going to probably in, influence that. The level of interest rates, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. So one reason people are not buying immediate annuities today is that interest rates are so low. There's a direct relationship between interest rates and what insurance company is going to pay you because if interest rates are higher, they can earn more on your money so they can pay you out more. So a lot of people are not buying these things today because interest rates are so low. If you expect the stock market to make 10, 15% returns, you sure don't want to put your money in annuity where they're going to pay you three or 4%. And then how risky do you think the stock market is? So this is one list where you essentially get full credit by just putting a list in there because they're, they're straightforward. It makes, I don't think there's a lot of uncertainty there. They add a few others, your marital status, your age, and then your pension, which to me is just part of the social security. That was not so straightforward. The problem is they don't explain that one. How do you think marital status would have an impact? There are joint life annuities, so that can have an impact. So a joint life is, it's gonna keep paying annuity until the second person dies. That, that could have an impact on you. We'll talk a little bit about how you can manage that, but your marital status, they don't really explain that in the article. They just say marital status, whether you're single or married. Your age, um, you know, if I'm 92 years old and it looks like my portfolio may not make it another three years, annuity may be the perfect way to go. And you say, you know what? Inflation is not gonna be an issue. Right? 92 year olds don't worry that much about inflation because inflation is a 10, 15, 20 year, Thing. Unless you're that, who was the lady from, what was she, 128 or 118, whatever it was. So maybe she should be worried about it. But still, the annuity might still be the best way to go. Because if you don't have enough money, you only have 300,000, 200,000 left, and you're 92 and you're really healthy, yeah, the annuity may be the way to go. And then obviously your pension income. All right, so that's a list. You just throw that list in there and you've got it made. All right, so what, what did they learn? So how much should you annuitize? Whatever your minimum income needs are after Social Security, whatever that is. So if you need $40,000 a year to live on and Social Security is $20,000, then annuitize so you get $20,000 of income. Now, what about inflation? Well, each year with inflation, you annuitize, maybe every five years, you annuitize enough extra amount to cover that inflation increase, but at least cover your income. And, and most people would understand that. You'd like to have income coming in to cover your expenses. That makes some sense. So is that you generally need to annuitize a significant portion of your remaining wealth uh, while investing the balance. So where do you put the rest? So after you annuitize, put the rest in stocks, fixed income, and money market. So here's the key here. A lot of students miss this. So if you're doing an asset allocation, what do you do with that annuity? So you go, to, you go to a financial planner and they say, hey, you need to have 40% in stocks and 60% in bonds. And you're like, well, what about the annuity? So what do they say? They say the annuity is not part of fixed income. It's not a bond. They say make it a completely separate asset class. So you have to go to your financial planner and say, well, what percentage should be in an immediate annuity? The other thing is, how do you value it? So... That value is going to be the present value, what income you think you're going to get. You're going to value just like you do human capital. This is kind of somewhat of a human capital. It's more bond-like than it's stock-like. In fact, it's more bond-like than human capital is, but they still say have it as a separate asset class. How would you model that? You would model it um, probably the same way you do Social Security. They don't mention that, but Social Security could be an asset on your balance sheet as well. It's going to be the present value. You have to figure out when you're going to die, present value that you use some discount rate. So it's essentially doing human capital, except for the dollar amount is much more mm -hmm. obvious. 
What's the difference between Social Security and this annuity? The biggest difference. What does Social Security give you that this annuity won't give you? Cost of living adjustment. That's a pretty good and benefit. You know what? Yeah, I looked at what the cost of living is going to be this year for Social Security. Have they announced anything yet? Yeah, that's crazy, isn't it? Yeah, it may set a record from 40, last 50 years. That's going to be pretty, pretty amazing because probably most senior citizens aren't experienced a lot of that inflation. Some of them may, but a lot of them don't because they may not drive all that much. So that's going to be interesting. <clears throat> all right. Obviously, the annuity is not going to help you with an unusual expense because you're going to get a fixed income. So you got to have some way to handle some unusual thing going on. So that's that's where your um, your portfolio is going to help you, but insurance will help you with this as well. So you need to make sure. Maybe you need a Medicare supplemental product, a product of some kind. Um, you can't really rely on Social Security for this. I'm not really sure. My mom is in assisted living. I don't know what happens when her portfolio runs out. If med Medicare, how much it's going to pay of her assisted living, we'll find that out. We probably should be studying that now. But she's got about eight, nine years of income. Since I got to make up the difference, you know, it's kind of an interesting uh, equation to figure out. Obviously, you got to make provisions for your heirs. I'm dealing with that with one individual now who's fairly wealthy and he's broken his portfolios in different pieces. Some of it's for his charity, some of it's for his kids. And we're asking the question, well, if you got part of this is for your kids, how do we invest that? And he said, well, pretty aggressively, we can put it in stocks. That's fine with me. Same thing with my charities. You know, if the stock market does well, they'll get a lot of money. If it doesn't do well, they won't get much money. Why do I care? I'll be dead kind of thing. But you still want to think about that. Um, the greater the tolerance you have for financial risk, the higher proportion of your excess assets will be in stocks. That's pretty obvious, right? You don't need this article to tell you that. However, they did say those assets outside of your annuity, they say, we don't care how risk aggressive you are, you should not have more than half your assets in stocks. I think I could debate that. If, you know, if you got a billion dollars and you're leaving it to your heirs, why not stick it in the stock market if they're 20 years old or whatever? But they say that whatever you have in the stock market and bond market, no more than half of it should be in stocks. All right, then they ask this question on another list. Why don't people buy these annuities? So very similar to the question asked in the previous article. The previous article says it's these biases. So we'll see maybe a little bit of that here, but you're going to see a very different list here, I think. Very few Americans um, have pensions today, given the alarming um, the confluence of economic and democratic changes. The number of people choosing life annuities should be larger. That's exactly what the other article said. Many market participants believe that's stock for long term. There's one of the reasons right there. Um, oh, what was the guy's name? Martin uh, Seifert. Oh, I can't remember his name, but. There's, there's a famous guy, stocks for the long term. If you can wait long enough, stocks are going to be the best return. Um, in the long term, we're all dead. So how long do you have to wait? How, how long have stocks gone where they've been a horrible investment? Well, if you include inflation, there's been some 20, 30, 40 year periods where stocks didn't give you inflation. So the biggest one was the Great Depression, but even the stock market decline in the early 70s, that was fairly significant. The stock market dropped in half and inflation was so high, it took a long time for you to come back and make enough return to cover inflation. Um, so the stocks for the long run, it's true stocks have had positive returns over most 10, 20 year periods, but when you take inflation out, or if you look at bonds, they don't always win. The other thing I think is really important here they don't talk about is stocks for the long run. You may put this into your note because I think it's important. This dominance of stocks as an asset class is a very US centric phenomenon. It's not true for most other stock markets. You can't say that about Japan. Japan was at what, 40,000 in, in 1989? Where is the, where is the, Nikkei, where's the Nikkei today? Well, today, much lower than it was yesterday, wasn't it? 
it up. Uh, pass it up. Here it is. Twenty. So it's actually come back a lot, but it was at forty thousand in nineteen eighty nine. So if you had 400,000 in the Nikkei in 1989 today, you'd have about 28,000. When was 1989? 21, 43 years ago? No, 33 years ago? 33 years. I'm not saying it takes 33 years to get back to where you were. It's 33 years and you're still 25% below where you were. That's, could the US market do that? Of course it could. I can show you valuations of the stock market where it's 40, 50% overvalued. What did the NASDAQ do in the 2000 crash? Dropped like 80%. It came back pretty fast, running fast, and then 2008 crushed it again. Um, so we, we say stocks for the long run, but we don't realize how much of that is very unique to the United States. Uh, World War II, it harmed us but it wiped out Europe. <laughs> it wiped out, obviously, Asia, and, you know, whole countries are just decimated. So the U.S. just has been far more fortunate than other countries. Um, over the long run, unless stocks achieve excess returns about treasury bonds at least twice as high as they generally expect, it often makes more sense to annuitize. Um, so the other argument I'm making is the stock market has been great historically, but today, at the time they wrote this article, stocks look somewhat expensive it's it's unlikely they're going to continue their historical and they were somewhat right on this one i forget when they wrote this article 2007 so yeah i mean <laughs> they're writing this a year before the 2008 crisis and they're saying yeah you're you're not likely to well they got that exactly right <clears throat> all right so don't forget to put this in your list because it's not in the numbered list okay <laughs> So one reason people don't buy annuities, they just think stocks are always going to win in long term. I should just, just go for it and just suffer through the, the ups and downs. 2020 taught us what? Stock market crashes. Oh, it could take three months to come back. Is that always true? <laughs> no, that was 2020 was an unusual, unusual bounce back. Um, all right. Too expensive. Annuities are too expensive. Um, insurance companies have a lot of loading. Um, that is true, but you're getting a lot of insurance protection in doing that. So yeah, they are expensive. You can, one thing I love about annuities, we're going to talk about this when we talk about equilinked annuities and how complicated they are, almost impossible to understand. This is not a complicated product. So let's say, let's say you go to five companies you have five choices, A, 500 a month for life, B, 575 a month for life, et cetera. How hard is it gonna be for you to make a decision? What would you decide? I'd go with the highest monthly income. Are there other things to consider? Well, you have, you're certain, maybe you have some surrender charges, those kind of things. You can't really do surrender charges on this. But some there are some bells and whistles on this thing. Some of them allow you to add more money at some rate or whatever. So you do get some of that. But most people, it's like, tell me what the monthly income is. I'll take the highest one. Not too difficult. Just like life insurance, right? With life insurance, give me the lowest premium. I'll go with that. Um, so it's, it's not a complicated product. So if they cost too much, one thing you might do is shop around. Right now they look expensive because interest rates are so low. So that's part of it. What if I get sick? So if I put my money in this annuity, I can't get my hands on it in case there's something going on. So yeah, you need to, you need to provide for your health insurance. Now, one thing, if you buy a Medicare gap coverage, that's going to cost you, say, $100 a month. Well, then you need to buy an annuity that's going to cover that extra $100 a month. So I think you cover that expense. Um, there are, here's some of that innovation. Some annuities allow you to withdraw as much as 30% of your future payment uh, at five-year intervals. So some of them actually added that as an option. Uh, that may be not something that you make as a big part. You know, 
the income is probably more important than that. But if you can get the highest income and get that, you know, that option is probably not a bad thing to do. It's you're unlikely to need it, but just in case. Inflation is a big one. Annuities do not pay for inflation for the most part. They do say there are inflation linked annuities. I wish I could show you one because when you buy an inflation linked annuity, your monthly income drops dramatically because that's so dangerous for insurance companies. How do they cover themselves for that risk? Well, they're probably gonna buy treasury inflation linked bonds. Those yields are so ridiculously low. You know, it's, you're just not gonna get much income. I don't know what the difference is, but it may be $500 a month versus 270. I mean, you're probably gonna give up a sizable amount of monthly income. So I doubt inflation linked annuities. Some of y'all can research that and see if there is a decent product out there. But right now with tip yields so, so, so low, I doubt you're gonna do that. Um, so other people say, you know what? I'll just, I'll do this myself. I'll kind of, I'll replicate it myself. You can't really do that. <laughs> you can't find something that's going to suddenly give you a lot more money if you live too long without involving a life insurance company. It's just really tough. Unless you can get all your neighbors together and you're all going to pull your, you know, it's just not going to happen. Um, you, this is the unique nature of life insurance. Now, Social Security has figured out how to do this by simply ripping you guys off and overcharging you. And then you'll, you know, so we're, my generation is stealing from you. So that's really good for me. That works really, really well. Life insurance companies can't do that. They can't steal from future policyholders that give you a really good deal. They've got to make it actually sound. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, they know what they're doing. They're the only ones that can really do this and do it safely. Um, you, if you do it yourself, the risk of running out of income is always going to be there. You know, that strategy I said that you'll only take 4% out of your portfolio every year. Yeah, if you do that, you'll never run out of money. But if your portfolio drops in half, your income drops in half, you may not be able to survive that. If your portfolio drops in half, your annuity is going to keep paying you the same amount. So, um, so we don't know the future. The only way that has this risk is to buy an insurance product. Um, what about money left for your kids? Then, yeah, that's it. But I love their argument on the other side of this. So I want to leave some money for my kids. Well, what happens if you live too long? You're not going to take money from your kids. <laughs> so you can't have it both. You can't say, I want to leave money for my kids. So I want to buy the annuity. And then you live too long. Then you're going to... Your kids are going to have to pay you, hopefully, or else your kids are going to say, hey, I don't, I've don't, i never met you. I don't know who you are. So treat your kids well. But yeah, I mean, that's that's the other side of this argument is they may be the ones that have to bail you out. So, um, so you might view this as a way to keep your kids from having to bail you out by at least having some protection there. Uh, the longer you live, the less you would be left to your loved ones. If you live a long life, you might need your kids to care for you. Annuitization, the insurer absorbs, absorbs that risk rather than in your kids. Without that, your heirs absorb that risk. How much better would it be to provide your heirs with substantial legacy up front upon retirement or perhaps even earlier? And then at the end of your life, they can be residual claimants of personal effects in any unused funds. Um, I don't know. Um, how important is that that you leave money to your heirs? What's Warren Buffett saying about his heirs? He's essentially saying they're on their own, even though he's worth billions. If you're Warren Buffett's daughter, would you say, hey, I'm glad he has that opinion? She's probably very wealthy, I think, right? She's getting some really good jobs, but she's not a billionaire. You know, it's, it's interesting. I don't know what Bill Gates is doing or Melinda Gates are doing for their heirs. Okay. This one, I like this argument as well. I think we talked about this one a little bit. If I buy an annuity, don't I lose control over my funds? And he says, yes. And thankfully, so do your kids. I think I told you a story, but I tell again, in 2000, in 2000, this guy at my church, he goes, hey, my brother's telling me put all of my mom's retirement into tech stocks. His mom has Alzheimer's. She's in a nursing home. Put all of our money into tech stocks in 2000. Anything happened in 2000 to tech stocks, <laughs> like falling 80 percent? And I told him, you know, tech stocks are really, really expensive right now. They're kind of off the charts expensive. And he said, Yeah, my brother says anytime they fall, they always come back. 
I said, well, how much history do you have of that? NASDAQ hasn't existed all that long. How much history do you have? But I don't know what he did. I never saw him again. I hope he didn't do it. There's another lady in my church. She said, how can I get my broker to buy tech stocks that same year? And I said, you know, tech stocks are grossly overvalued. She looked at me like I was an idiot. It's like, well, I should ask someone who knows what you're talking about. It's like, sorry. I don't know what she did with her money. Hopefully she didn't do it. Um, but yeah, you, you probably want to protect some of your income from your kids so they can't make stupid decisions because they may not have your best interests at heart. Um, and who knows what your mental capacity is going to be when you're 95, 96. So, you know, at least you have some protection there. And it protects us, protects us from them overspending your retirement. And here's the interest case, interest rate case. This one may not be as big of a case. Now he's writing this back in 2007 when interest rates are much higher than today. Interest rates are coming up. It's starting to get a little more interesting. Uh, I wish I had captured some annuities back in 2020 when interest rates hit their bottom so I could compare. It does make a huge difference. We'll, we'll calculate. When we do calculations, we'll, we'll actually do the calculations so you can see how material interest rates are to a monthly income. It's, it's pretty material as you can imagine. Especially if you're talking about someone who could live 30 years, interest rates of 3% versus 5%, that makes a huge difference over 30 years as far as the income. So it, it can be really, really material. Um, now, when I was at USA, our CEO said, we got to fix this. So he put me on a project to fix this. We created the worst product ever. I think they sold one of them. And we knew it was a horrible product. But what he wanted was a product where people could put their money in. And then if interest rates rose, we could, we could readjust and give them a higher income. The problem with that is if interest rates didn't rise, we were stuck, you know, how do we cover our risk? How do we actually provide them this product? And the only way we do it was, was really taking a lot of value up front. I mean, their monthly income had to be so reduced so we could protect ourselves from that terrible, terrible product. We actually patented the product, which is kind of laughable. <laughs> that was just, so I, I had to actually, even after I left USA, I had to sign the patent every year. They sent me this document. I always felt so embarrassed. I'm going to show you later the product I wanted us to patent because I think it's a great product, but they made me create this product, which I thought was horrible. But that was the issue. He was like, no one's buying this product because rates are so low. Let's give them something so that if rates rise, we can fix it for them and everything's fine, but there's just no way to do that without the company taking ridiculously horrible risk. So how could you handle this? Well, one way to handle this, which I think is really pretty practical, let's say you wanna put $300,000 into annuity, but you're worried about interest rates, then do 50,000 every six months and build up your annuity over time. And use, what's that called? You don't know that term? Dollar cost average. If you heard that term before, you just dollar cost average in. If interest rates suit up, maybe do more at that point in time. That wouldn't have been a great strategy if you'd been doing the last few years because interest rates have been low for so long, but now you get a chance you can just kick a lot more in um, and see. So yeah, I mean, it, that is an issue. Um, so interest rates may not move, but life expectancy might improve. So you might be adding three, four or five years to your life. Um, so yeah, he's talking about the product we created. It's not an easy product to create. I remember sitting in those committee meetings uh, and some of them, there was no actuary in the room. So I had to represent actuaries. So, you know, my, I don't have enough brain cells to represent actuaries, but I had to somehow figure out how to do it. And some of the marketing people were saying stuff and I'm thinking, yeah, you do that and we're insolvent. There's no way you can offer that product and not put the whole company at risk. And I, I would just say, if, if you do that, I'm going to go tell on you to the actuaries because they'll come in and stop you. But they were, they were talking about stuff that just you just cannot do that. Um, so 2017, right? Or 2007? What month of 2007? I don't know when their final draft came out, but August 2007? I don't think curve has an I in it. So 
So um, yeah, I'm not sure why. So 2007, let's see if I can get some rates here. 2007. We said August 2007. So interest rates were right around 5% then. And they were thinking that was low. You are thinking, wow, we'll never get there again. But they were thinking that was low. Now we're getting up there now, but we're not anywhere close to that, are we? So today, three and a half. The 10 years getting back to three and a half percent. And we're starting to think that's a high number, but 5%. So they were thinking 5% is just way too low. Boy, I bet there's people wishing they bought an annuity back then <laughs> at 5% with interest rates as low as they are since then. So um, who knows? What if you're in Japan? You know, Japan, they would kill for a three and a half percent number. They've been struggling just to get up to 0.5% for decades. So who knows? What's a low rate anymore? We just don't know what that is. So. They keep talking about these recent innovations. I don't think they're really there. Uh, this, there's not much actuaries can really do to add inflation, add protection, because anything they do creates risk for the insurance company. And for the handle that risk, they really have to kill the product quite significantly. So it's just no easy solutions. Um, so you should be buying annuities. They have guaranteed payments. You can't outlive them. They're low costs versus how you could get that protection anywhere else. Um, the reason they price features such as inflation adjustment, I don't agree with that at all. Argument for this income solution in retirement is compelling. Income annuities may also be a vehicle that enables retirees to delay Social Security. That's, that's an important con concept there. Social Security, uh, I, I may have to show you Social Security because it's pretty massive. I don't know if y'all looked at it. I don't know if y'all even have Social Security yet. Have, have y'all been paying Social Security tax? So you can go to the Social Security website and you can pull up your income. If y'all know that, you can log in. So maybe I have to show you. Um, they'll show you if you retire at 62, here's your income. If you retire at 65, here's your income. 67, here's your income. 70 is the latest you've retired because after 70, there's no change. It's pretty massive. If you wait from 62 to 70, your extra income is massive. If you can use one of these annuities to tie you in between 62 and 70, you can get a much, much higher income for Social Security. It may be worth it. That could be a really good reason to, to buy an annuity as a substitute for Social Security. And that way, you don't have to worry about the inflation. You don't need this to cover you for inflation in your 80s and 90s. You just got to get it to your 70s, and then Social Security is going to cover you for the inflation. That's a very, very good strategy. All right, good article, interesting article. I don't agree with all of it, especially some of these special whistle, bells and whistles he's talking about. Um, if you wanna to try to update some of these charts and show something more current. current. So I talked about D versus DC. You can find some, um, some pretty good up-to-date charts out there, not there, but you, you can. Maybe you just need the, the right words. Maybe you just need images. No, that's not, I don't know what that stands. What is, what are they doing there? What is D? <laughs> there we go, 2021, that's pretty recent. All right, so there's the chart. So y'all can put that chart into your paper and get some, some brownie points, even actual points. So 30% defined benefits, 20%, 10%. This is private sector. The public sector is still heavily pension plans. So teachers, firemen, policemen, they, they still love pension plans. So this is private side. And here's the DC side, almost 100%. I don't know who's working for a firm that doesn't have a DC at all. That's kind of crazy. USA shut its pension plan down somewhere in here. I fought like mad to keep it. 
they shut it down, but then they really sweetened the DC quite dramatically. It was pretty amazing how much they just really increased it. But the problem was they say, hey, you put 8% in, we'll match 8%. The problem is your lower paid employees can't put 8% in the DC. So it ended up being somewhat of a sweetened deal for the wealthiest employees, the poorest, or even if they did put the money in, what I do, they take it out, they borrow against it. So what, what you're doing by doing this is you're putting your poorest employees that in great peril. They just, they just, they can't take advantage of the higher DC because they, they can't afford to put that much away. Uh, so yeah, it's pretty easy to find. In fact, uh, I've seen this, this group before, they do some updates every year on this kind of stuff. So yeah, it's interesting stuff. All right, what questions do you have on, on the, the last two articles? Let's see if you understand the rubric. Where is the rubric? I, I loaded the rubric, where did it go? Right, so define longevity risk. Baby boomers is in both, both articles. Inertia, what does inertia mean? We've been such a habit of saving for retirement. We don't know how to flip into the unsaving, the de decumulation. What do financial planners say? Add a few years to your life expectancy and that should take care of it. Well, you can live 10 years, 15 years longer, or if you, one of y'all might set the record for longest life. Biases is a big part of this article. So make sure you have those biases. Remember you have that separate Word document that goes through them. Make sure you have those in there and tie them back to the, to the article. I gave you their solutions last class. Anybody remember those? Do you have them in your notes? You said uh, reframe. You reframe. Said, you said uh, the employee could be trained to learn things. Yeah. Reframe, training. New products, better marketing, there's one more. The fault option. The fault option. Yeah. The reframing and marketing to me is the same thing. The training is somewhat related to that. New products and then the uh, default option. The five the five forces, it's just right there in the article. One, two, three, four, five. That's real straightforward. That one, I, I think almost everybody gets full credit there. You seem to summarize, you do need to discuss them. You can't just list them. And you can certainly put graphs in there to, to support it. The seven factors, that's the one where there's actually 10 if you add marital status, age, and pensions. There you can get away with just listing them. That's kind of a freebie. Um, their recommendations, that's a list as well. Go through that list. Annuitize at least enough to cover your expenses. Make it a separate asset class. You know, go through those to remember that list of recommendations. And the last one's a list that's right in there. Why don't people um, annuitize? He has a list. Remember, I added one more before the list, which is the view of the stock market. All right, that one's only 0.5% for some reason. The coverage is 40%, but the clarity and organization critical thinking, uh, there's a little bit of double counting in, in this. Um, where if you, you do poorly on the coverage, you'll probably do poorly on those. So it's coverage is really more than just 40%, but I, I do tend to look at uh, how well you discuss each one of these, those type of things. All right, anybody finished their first draft yet? I know some are in pretty good shape. All right, the students that really mess up on this paper haven't started yet. And they, they're like, it's not due for a few weeks, so why should I start? That's gonna kill you. I'm expecting really great papers. So you need to spread this out. You need to be already have drafted it out. If you wait to the last second, first of all, you're gonna forget all of it. You're gonna be a really bad paper. And then when you get a really bad grade back, like what happened? What happened was you started way too late. All right, so you need to get this paper done. If you wanna show me your draft in pieces or whatever, you know, you can certainly do that. I won't get you to an A paper necessarily, but I'll certainly tell you if you got some major disaster on your hands that you need to fix. All right, so we'll never talk this paper again unless you have questions now or you come by my office hours to discuss them.
I do really want great papers. So don't, don't give me mediocre, kind of flip through the article real fast, actually read it and get, I, I like what they're saying here. I think it's really, really important. It's gonna help you in interviews. They're talking about stuff that insurance companies are definitely talking about. Gives you a good list of stuff to bring up in an interview discussion. Um, if I'm talking to an insurance company, one of the questions I got from USA, which I don't know why USA ever hired me. That was gotta be one of the worst interviews ever. I had no idea what USA did. And one person asked me a question about that. And boy, my answer was so stupid. And Pat was one of the interviewers and she, she goes, no, what he meant was, I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's what I meant. She, she fixed the whole thing, thankfully. But, but one of the questions I ask is, what are, what's the, one of the most important issues today uh, that you think this industry is facing? I would bring this kind of stuff in. People are living longer. They're not prepared for retirement. This industry is uniquely prepared to help them, but it's not selling this product because it doesn't make money selling this product. It's missing an incredible opportunity. You know, it would be a great answer. And you could use a lot of these articles to answer that. So be, they'd be really impressed. So I'm giving you some stuff that if you really, really learn it, you know, if you write it and forget it, it's not going to help you anyway. If you really learn it, boy, it can be really, really quite, quite valuable for, for uh, an, an interview question. All right, we're gonna leave it there. So we'll jump back to the class notes here. Hopefully I'll, I've been... I did square it, share the screen, right? So that's there, just make sure, okay. I always love it when I get home and I get the videos and it's like, yeah, y'all noticed that the microphone on one of the classes was horrible. When I use that microphone in the room, it is just, it just cannot hear it at all. All right. Okay, let's let's do a little bit more on the ethics of life insurance. So, pretty amazing article from about ten years ago. This guy won the lottery. That sounds good. If you won the lottery, would you want your name in the press? What's gonna happen when your name goes into the press? A lot of people are gonna suddenly be calling you, aren't they? And guess what? Life insurance company is gonna start calling you. A young unmarried grocery store worker with no children, one half of 336 million, bought a $100 million life insurance policy. All right, a young unmarried grocery worker with no children has won the lottery. How many of y'all are the first thing that comes to your mind is, oh man, you need life insurance. Does he need life insurance at all? <laughs> Can't he insure his own life? Remember what you just covered on human, what was one of the factors for how much life insurance you need? Your wealth. More wealth means what? Less life insurance. He doesn't need any life insurance. But he bought a $100 million life insurance policy. Now he's suing, suing his financial advisors, along with other investors who encouraged him to assume tens of millions of dollars in debt. All right. He may not be a, a really bright person. I don't know. He bought life insurance. He could be, though. There are some smart people who really get destroyed by this industry. But think about it. He won the lottery, so he bought life insurance and borrowed a lot of money. Doesn't sound too smart, does it? Just on the surface. But who knows? Because this industry, this industry can make you do. I mean, I've I've had some people with three college degrees that got ripped off by this industry, and I I just like shaking my hand. I can't believe you did this. So he bought a lottery ticket, lump sum cash, netted him seventy million after tax. So he's doing pretty well, seventy million dollars. Could any of y'all live off of seventy million? How many of y'all be like uh, maybe a few years after about three years? I don't think you can make it. Shortly thereafter, he began investing with two financial advisors who were also attorneys and insurance. My word, that's like the. I won't make fun of attorneys and insurance agents, but I mean, if you're a list, the most unpopular people in the world, attorneys, insurance agents, finance advisors, I think you could throw a used car salesman. I think you got you got you got the list. I know some really good used car salesmen though. Um, 
He bought four policies from four companies, telling him he could earn 50 million by the time he was 50 years old. How do you make money buying life insurance? It's really pretty bizarre because you're buying life insurance. That's what I was going to tell this one guy who bought one of these policies. It's like, you know, you bought, he says, oh, it's a great investment. You bought life insurance. They're taking premiums out. And if you don't die, that's all lost money. <laughs> you're not getting that back. The only way you're getting money back is you got to die. So how are you making money with life insurance? It's, it's kind of a bizarre thing. We'll talk about uh, modified endowed contracts here a little bit later. But um, he says the agents made $1 million in commissions, exploiting the fact that he knew nothing about life insurance. Would you expect a long a, a young grocer to be an expert in life insurance? Probably not. So what is what's his protection? He has a financial advisor. Whose interests are they looking out for? What does the law say? If they're fiduciaries, whose interests do they have to put first? The clients. If they're not fiduciaries, whose interests do they have to put first? They can put their own interests first. Are they fiduciaries or not? You would think they would be, but they could, they could not, they could be financial advisors who aren't fiduciaries. It's perfectly possible. You would think they put his interests first. Um, so he had no need for such life insurance, so much life insurance. I don't think he had a need for any life insurance. I still have life insurance people telling me I need life insurance. It's like, what more incentive do my brothers have for me to die? My word, they're going to be rich if I die. I don't need to add more into that pot. He stood no chance to benefit from the insurance financially since he was not named as a beneficiary of the trust that owned the policies. That's pretty crazy. Two years later, the defendants attempted to persuade him to exchange his existing life insurance policies for a single $600 million policy. He learned that his existing policies were highly unsuitable for him. Now, they are required to do that. So there's his lawsuit. Now, if you're in this business, if you're a fiduciary, you got to put their interests first. If you're not a fiduciary, you have to at least make sure the product is suitable. But the suitable standards are pretty weak standard. You just have to prove that someone in the world could conceivably be buying this product and it makes sense. Not your product. Your product could be so horrendously bad, no one would buy it. But if someone could buy that type of product anywhere in the world, you meet your suitability standards. So it's a very, very low standard. Um, highly unsuitable and were funded in a way that would provide him no potential benefit and would leave the trust liable for large amounts of gift tax. The claim says he finally surrendered the policies after paying nearly $2 million in premiums. He is seeking damages. Do you think he's got a good case? You remember my Donya story? I thought she had a good case. <laughs> they sold her life insurance and she sure didn't need life insurance. I thought she had a good case. She didn't want to pursue it. She said, I didn't want to go through all of this. I can kind of understand that. Um, and you say, well, he was stupid to do this, but he's got a lot of money. He, he needs an advisor. It, so what should he have done? He should have called me. I would have done it for free and he would have bought a bunch of Vanguard index funds and he would have been in great shape, right? Because when did he buy this? 2013? After the 2008 crisis, boy, he'd be in great shape today. He'd have a lot of money. Um, do you think they, they let him run? And do you think the commission influenced their decision? So if he'd come to me, I would have done it for free, stuck in Vanguard funds, Say, hey, you can't sue me. I'm just doing what any practical person would do in your age. Stick it into a Vanguard fund. Um, I would probably tell him you need a ta tax advisor. He needs tax advice, don't you think? And I don't do taxes. So he needs to put this in the most tax efficient way he can. He's probably going to get married he'd soon, have kids. There's probably some things he needs to do. Probably set up some trusts. Um, <laughs> Yeah, there's so some stuff I probably wouldn't touch, but when it gets to the investing, yeah, when you're ready to invest, I'll stick it in Vanguard funds for you and we'll be done with it. 
So it doesn't, I, I was, I would have done the same thing for Tim Duncan. Tim Duncan got ripped off by his advisor and he sued him. I said, Tim Duncan, come to me. I do it for free. Just so I could say Tim Duncan's my client. That would have been worth it just for me. I would have been worth it for me just to be able to talk to Tim Duncan. So, all right. You know, you have these notes in the, in the class notes on the articles. If you want to read through those to kind of double check, make sure you didn't miss something. Those are all in there. I'm not going to go through those again. I think we hit most of that. It does have some good quotes from the articles. So if you want to see if maybe you missed something, um, it's like 5% of the entire notes is, is, is that stuff. Okay, we're going to shift gears. So we talk about the economics and insurance. Wonderful industry for products, horrible industry for incentives. I think if you work for this industry, you're working with an industry that's very much needed, does sell stuff like immediate annuities, like life insurance, very, very needed. I hate this commission approach. I think that's terrible. I'll see what y'all say on the exam. You do have to you know, put my side of the argument down. Um, but let's talk about these products. <coughs> And we're going to start with life insurance. We're going to do life insurance, then annuities, then health insurance, I think, and then other, other things like disability and uh, um, uh, long-term care. I can't remember if I do health insurance before or after those last few. We'll talk about group insurance. But let's just start, talk with, start with life insurance. So life insurance doesn't insure you against death because we assume we're all going to die, but it insures you against premature death. Dying before you, you expect to. Supposedly, you can only have one claim for life insurance in a lifetime. There are people who have had more than one claim. And how in the world does that happen? Well, I don't think there's been many of them. Uh, I remember one story a guy went out in the wilderness and they couldn't find him. And after a certain number of years, they just assumed you're dead. And then a few years later, he was found, and then he died after that. So it's possible you can have two life insurance claims in a lifetime. Um, that's pretty rare, but that is the thing. If someone gets lost at sea or something like that, and you're like, we can't find the body, we can't get a death certificate. After a certain number of years, we're just going to assume the person is dead. And then they show up later, then yeah, you could have a policy. Um, there was one guy, boy, I, I should... Um, yeah, I, you ever watch those forensic files, those criminal shows. There's two of them on, I do want to show you. Uh, but one of them, this guy, he and his wife, they, there's some of debate whether his wife was in on this or not. But he wanted to fake his death so that his wife could get the insurance and then they would get together and run off together. But he needed a body. So he found this guy who looked a lot like him and he befriended him. And then he invited him over to his house and the guy started getting really skittish, so he didn't go. <laughs> He's like, there's something weird about this guy. So now this guy had to find another substitute. So he, he runs to Home Depot and he grabs his friend. He says, hey, come over and help me work on my car. So he puts this guy under the car, has the car fall over on the guy's chest and kills him. And then he runs and hides. And so I forget how they did the body. I think they like set the car, I forget the whole thing, set the car on fire or something, but it became really obvious this wasn't the guy that was insured. And sure enough, they found the guy later. They actually caught the couple together at a restaurant. I mean, it's just a bizarre story. Um, the poor guy who got killed, you know, you're thinking, boy, how tragic that is. But think about the guy who was the first, so the first, you know, the one that was selected because he looked like the guy. Think what he's thinking now. I was like, boy, I just missed that one really close. Um, so, you know, that guy could have two claims in a lifetime because his wife did collect the life insurance and then they took it back later, obviously. Um, all right, so there's a few things we have to cover for life insurance that do apply to other insurance. The first one is insurable interest. You have to make sure when you're buying an insurance product, especially life insurance, but others, you got to make sure that you have some interest in that person's life, that you don't want them to die. So let's say someone moves in next door to you. You've never met them before. They come over and they say, hey, we signed this insurance policy. I just bought $500,000 on your life. Would you feel comfortable with that? Probably make you feel really uncomfortable. Do they have insurable interest on your life? 
Probably not. So that policy wouldn't work. The insurance company wouldn't accept it. But how does the insurance company find that you have an insurable interest? If you can get the person to sign the policy, that's one way you do it. So don't sign something. You know, if your neighbor comes over and say, hey, sign this, just sign it. No, don't read it. Yeah, that's that's a little dangerous. So there needs to be insurable interest. You you want the person whose life is insured, you prefer them to be alive. Whoever bought the policy should prefer that person be alive than dead. Now, if you buy life insurance on your own policy, you have insurable interest in your own policy, your own life, usually with your kids, with your spouse, you know, certain, certain things are just assumed that you have insurable interest. Um, so if you buy the policy, insure your own life, you've got it. There's no legal limit. If you want to buy $10.7 billion of life insurance on your life, you can do it. If you've got enough money to pay all the premiums, you can't buy it all from one company. But if you know there's 2,000 life insurance companies, you can go to every single one of them and buy a million dollar policy if you want to. Now, if you do that and you die, they're probably going to investigate that claim very carefully. <laughs> but they don't offset each other. Health insurance does. So you can't buy health insurance from 2000 co companies. And if you break your leg, you get a bunch of money. The only one of them is gonna cover you. But life insurance is not like that. You can buy life insurance. There's no limit. They can't say, wow, you bought way too much life, way too much life insurance, but they will investigate if something unusual happens. Um, if you and the insured are not the same person, then insurable interest has to exist, but life insurance is really unusual. The insurable interest only has to exist when you buy the policy. It doesn't have to exist later. That's not true for auto insurance. You can't buy auto insurance and then sell your car to your neighbor and they say, hey, no, I don't want to keep your insurance. You can't do that because you're two very different drivers. So as soon as you sell your car to your neighbor, even though you keep paying the premiums, your neighbor doesn't have insurance coverage. The insurance company is going to say, no, you weren't covered. But you can do that with life insurance. So a husband buys life insurance on his wife. They get divorced. They hate each other's guts. They're screaming at each other in the court. They move to different coasts. He can, he can keep that policy in place. And if she passes away, he collects. All right. Kind of interesting. Have there ever been cases like that where something bad has happened? Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've seen that. I've actually, I might tell you a story of one couple that was, boy, they hated each other's guts and she kept the policy on his life. Um, so how do you handle if you're insuring another person? You got to get that person's consent. The insurance company wants the person to know that you bought life insurance on their on them. Now we're going to talk about a really bizarre policy later. It's called corporate owned life insurance, where your employer buys life insurance on your life. Does your employer have insurable interests on your life? And a lot of people say no. Why would they care if I, they'll just hire another employee? But the IRS has ruled, but why does your employer do that? We'll talk about it. It's for tax reasons They do that they do that. And IRS has ruled that yes, your employer can have insurable interests on your life. So we'll talk about that later. It's a little bizarre, but it is possible. This is true for all insurance, auto insurance, homeowners, but Life insurance has got a special case. The next one is anti or adverse selection. The simple fact that you buy insurance gives information to the insurance company. They assume the fact that you buy insurance means you're riskier than people who don't buy insurance. They assume that people who buy life insurance are more likely to die earlier than people who don't buy life insurance. They assume that people who buy annuities are healthier and more likely to live a long time than people who don't buy annuities. So what do they do? The simple fact that you buy insurance makes you riskier and so they're gonna charge you more. It puts you into another category. So it's kind of strange, how do you get around that? So people who are not healthy are more likely to buy life insurance than people who are healthy. People who know they have longevity in their family are less likely to buy life insurance than people who, who don't have longevity in their family. Um, mortality tables that we're gonna look at, they adjust for that. They know that if, hey, these people that are looking for life insurance, they're more likely to die than the people who aren't. Annuity tables adjust for it as well. People who buy annuities are more likely to live long time than people who don't buy annuities. So they're both in there. Here's the question I asked the actuaries. I haven't got an answer to that. So you actuaries need to ask this question. But at USA, we had people, the same person 
owns life insurance and an immediate annuity. And that person both die too early and live too long. I argue, no, they can only do one or the other. So I tell actuaries, we should give that person a break in their premiums. We shouldn't charge them for adverse selection because they can't do both. So anything we're charging them more for life insurance because they bought life insurance, we should give back to them. You know, but, and they just laugh at me like I'm an idiot, but I think it's a good question actually. Because it's not inconsequential. Your life insurance premiums may be 10, 15% higher just because you bought life insurance. And your annuity payments may be 10% lower just because you bought an annuity. We should give that back to them because they can't do both. But, but you actuaries, y'all need to find that out and email me when you figure it out. They probably didn't, they probably thought it was a stupid question because a finance person asked it. If I'd have been an actuary, they probably would have taken it more seriously. The next one's morale hazard. Morale hazard is more on the property side than it is on the life insurance side. But the thought here is you buy insurance, you become more risky, all right? A little different adverse selection. Adverse selection, you're more risky, so you want to buy the insurance. Morale hazard is you buy the insurance, so you become riskier. Okay, so the obvious thing here is you buy a Ferrari and you get in the car, you're going to drive it home. And you go, oh, wait, I forgot to buy insurance. So how do you drive home that night? Really, really safely. You might actually just sit in the parking lot in the car and the next morning buy insurance and then you drive home once you have the insurance. But you become a riskier driver once you buy that insurance, don't you? Um, can you apply that for life insurance? Is there someone out there saying, yeah, I don't have any life insurance. I'm not going to go bungee jumping. Probably not. Why? Because you got a lot more skin in the game. <laughs> you know, <laughs> death is kind of a kind of an ultimate thing. So are there people out there that that actually say I'm not going skydiving until I get my life insurance policy? Yeah, maybe, but that, that seems a little bizarre to me. Uh, suicide is one of those things. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But we'll talk about how insurance companies protect themselves from that. Okay, so the type of insurance, we're going to say there's actually two, but I'm actually going to debate whether some of these policies are actually permanent or not. But there's term and there's permanent or term and perm. That's how insurance companies talk about term and perm. Which do insurance companies prefer to sell? Where do they make more money? So they greatly prefer permanent insurance. Which is better for the customer usually? In a lot of cases, it's the term insurance. At USAA, they sold about 80% term and 20% perm. And the management's like, sell more perm, sell more perm. And they just, they couldn't do it. They, it was really, really hard to do that because USA doesn't have commissioned sales reps, so it's just tough to do. So term is per Protection without any savings. There's no investment here. You're just buying insurance, and that all that's all there is. Once the term ends, you don't long, you no longer have insurance. If you die during the term, you get the, the phase of the policy. If you die after the term, you lose it. Perm is both insurance and investments. It's two products mixed together. They're bundled. We're talking about unbundling here a little bit later. But it bundles the cash value and the permanent. So y'all gonna see I'm somewhat negative on certain aspects of this insurance, but I'm not the only one. And it's not a recent thing either. I found a, I found a book in the UTSA library. It's probably still there. It was published back in the forties or fifties talking about how crazy permanent insurance is. So he said, okay, you buy your life insurance where you're buying both insurance and you're getting an investment. He said, well, what if the auto insurance industry did that? What if the auto in industry said, okay, your auto insurance premium is $100 a month, but we're going to charge you $250. You're like, well, wait, why are you doing that? Well, we're going to take the $150, we're going to put it into an investment for you. Say, okay, that's interesting. Would you do that? Does that make sense? And then you have an auto accident. And they say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to take your savings and we're going to pay your auto accident through your savings. How do you like that? Say, well, wait a minute, I thought... I had insurance. Well, yeah, but we also did a savings account party and we don't want to pay for your auto accident. So we're going to take your savings element and pay that. Does that sound like a good deal to you? 
That's what permanent insurance is. <laughs> you pay for the insurance, you have a savings element. If you die, guess what they do? They take your savings element and they, they use that to pay your, your uh, life insurance. Doesn't sound like a good deal. Of it. That's the way he wrote it up in the book. Very, very negative on permanent insurance. Um, now, permanent insurance has a lot more pieces. There's whole life, which I actually like whole life. I'm going to talk about that. Endowment, I actually like endowment life. You're going to see that one. Universal life, I used to like it. I now hate, hate it with a passion. And I'll show you why, because my mom had one of these. Adjustable life, it's hardly sold anymore. Variable life, equilinked annuities. Oh, my word. Could I hate products more than I hate these? So someone in here needs to defend these products. So I don't want to step on toes. Anyone here sell these products? <laughs> Any of y'all stepping on toes? So we can have a debate. Permit, we have a big debate on these products. I'm not alone on this one either. Y'all heard of Susie Orman, right? I'm not a big Susie Orman fan either, but... Have y'all seen Saturday Night Live where Christy, Christian Wig does Susie Gorman? Y'all are too young for this, right? Y'all know who Chris, Christian Wig is? She does Susie Gorman better than Susie Gorman does Susie Gorman. It's so, y'all should Google that tomorrow. Susie Gorman, Christian Wig, and watch, watch that. And then go find Susie Gorman and watch it. It's hilarious. It's really hilarious. But anyway, Susie Gorman on variable life. Do you think she likes it or not? What does Susie Orman say about universal life, variable life? Here's someone who disagrees with her. She hates these products. She thinks they're terrible. I agree with, this is one of the few areas I actually agree with Susie Orman. Now, why don't I like Susan Orman? She also has horrible incentives. Some of the products she sells are horrible and she makes money off of them. This industry is so terribly corrupted by bad, bad, bad incentives. So uh, but anyway, I agree with her on these two products. We'll talk about, we're gonna spend a, quite a bit of time talking about the Equilink ones because I think it's the worst product. We're gonna do it Equilink annuities instead of Equilink life, but it's still there. All right, so there's a bunch of them. One thing you're gonna notice as you go down this list, what do you think increases as you go down this list? There's two things that increase as you go down this list. They both start with the letter C. Well, costs, but I'm gonna put it in a different words. Commissions and what's the other C word? Complexity. As you go down this list, the products get far more, higher, higher commissions, far more complexity, all right? So next class, we're gonna start with term. I love term, I'm a big term fan. And then we'll go into the, so y'all warn me if, if I'm stepping on toes, y'all warn me because I'm, I'm part of my idea in this class is it's nine o'clock. If I can rile you up, I at least keep you awake. I would be ecstatically happy if you're at a restaurant and I heard you say, you, you can't believe what my idiot professor said. I would love if you were talking about this class outside of this class. All right. All right. I'll leave it there so you can work some on your paper tonight. So tonight we're going to get into the insurance, the different types. But the first thing we're going to do is just look at them pictorially. So I created this chart and I used the mortality tables we're going to use later in class to make it as accurate as possible. So we're going to look at some simple ones. We're going to look at annual term, level term, ordinary whole life, and limit pay whole life. So there's no universal life. Those things like universal life, variable life, I can't actually do the drawings because they depend on how interest rates change and stock markets move. So the, the annual renewable term is this blue line and it's just going to go up every year. As you get older, your probability of dying goes up. So your premiums just rise dramatically. 
you're probably not going to buy annual renewal return when you're 85 years old. It's just going to be way too expensive. The level term, it's hard to even see it in here. I think I did a, a graph where you can see it a little better through 70. So the level term, it's going to be fixed for 10 years. And it's also going to get more expensive as you get older, but most people don't buy level term after age 60. So that's, that's one that's going to get too expensive as well. And then the whole life, ordinary whole life, this is this gray line. It's just a fixed premium your entire life. Never changes. The limit pay is some people, they buy life insurance. They want coverage for their whole life, but they don't want to pay premiums their whole life. So maybe what they're going to do is pay premiums until they retire and then they stop. You can see there the premiums a little bit higher, but it's not radically higher. So there's some advantage of that, that you just stop paying premiums at a certain time you're covered for the rest of your life. So what does this mean? Well, when you're young and you buy whole life, that's going to be the highest premium. But at some point it's gonna be cheaper because you're overpaying early. And the reason it's not way up here is because just like anything else, when you invest early, the compounding effect is much larger and much stronger. And so you get, you get that extra benefit but you are overpaying by quite a bit early in the years. Same thing with ordinary life. I'm a big fan of level term. Level term, if you look at it, it's cheaper than annual return. I mean, it's more expensive than annual return for the first half, cheaper for the second half, but you know exactly what you're gonna pay for, for 10 years. And so most people are not gonna buy level term or annual term past these years. We're gonna talk about that when we talk about buy term and invest a difference, which argues that's fine because you shouldn't buy insurance out here anywhere. Well, you buy insurance here when you have dependents, when the insurance is cheap. And then out here you have, you've invested the difference. So you have all these investments you can self-insure. So that's gonna be the argument, but that's the picture of these premiums. And then I did one last one where I really just went out the year 50 and you can really see the difference. Level term is really, really cheap up until you get to be about 60, 70 years old and then it, and then it, it changes quite dramatically. All right, let's get just a few issues before we get into the actual products. So insurance companies, biggest, biggest advantage is the tax benefits. If you buy life insurance and you die, your estate or your beneficiaries, they get that benefit completely tax-free. That's, that's pretty massive. It's pretty huge advantage. Um, you do have investment gains. If it's not a term, if it's a term policy, there's no investments. But if it's a whole life policy or permanent policy, you do have an investment element. That investment element is taxable if you take the money out before you die. So you can convert it into a taxable, uh, but it is tax deferred until you do that. So now what Congress decided was, hey, people are using life insurance to try to get around the tax code. And so what they would do is say, uh, well, probably the most, it's more of an endowment than life insurance. So an endowment is, what an endowment does is says, hey, if, if you die in the next 10 years, you get nothing. But if you live 10 years, we can give you a lot of money. And what people are saying is, hey, let me do an endowment. I'll put it in there. So, yeah, he's gonna have to, <laughs> sorry. Um, if, you, if they put it into the, he, he can say it here, but if you can just, you want to buy them another drink? Sorry. Um, so if if you buy the endowment and you don't die in the next ten years, people are saying, "Well, if I live, I get the insurance. That's tax free." Essentially, what they're doing is creating this invest investment vehicle that they get everything back tax free at the end of ten years. And IRS said, "No, that's you're doing that entirely for the tax benefits." Um, so he wasn't bothering me, but was he bothering y'all? So I don't. So, okay, sorry, I feel bad now, but um, some of y'all were like looking over, so sorry, but okay, when he comes back in, we'll let him know it wasn't bothering us. Um, so what Congress said is there's certain insurance policies that are what we call modified endowment contracts. They're just so obvious, they're only there for the tax treatment and we're not gonna give you that tax advantage. Now you still get the tax deferral, which is really, really valuable, but you lose the tax-free when you collect at the end. So essentially, if you do a 10-year modified endowment contract, you're tax deferred for 10 years, but when you take the money out, if you live the 10 years, that's all gonna be taxable. Now, what's taxable? 
Um, they said what was taxable is just the investment gains. So the entire thing, if you put 100,000 in and it matures at 150, only the $50,000 gain is taxable. The 100,000 is, you know, is your investment, okay? All right, so huge advantages. Can insurance be taxable? Yeah, you gotta be careful. If you buy life insurance with a premium that you took a tax deduction for, then that's gonna be taxable. So you gotta be careful. IRS, with the exception of healthcare, IRS is you either pay tax today and get tax-free in the future, or you, you don't pay tax today, you're gonna pay tax in the future. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna get you one way or the other. So they don't like to give you complete tax-free except for with health insurance. Um, and they did fix this. This doesn't mean, again, doesn't mean that matured endowments are a terrible product. I'm actually gonna show you a matured endowment, which I think is a wonderful product. It's still taxable, but it's not, it's not horrendously taxed. Okay, but I'm not a tax person, so, uh, but this is one reason people like to use life insurance for estate tax planning, because they're trying to uh, avoid estate tax or pay for the estate tax. If you can do it with a tax-free environment, a uh, vehicle, that's great. But the IRS, again, is real picky that you don't do that in a way that you're just avoiding taxes. So you got to set it up. So I'm not a tax person. If you're going to do this for tax reasons, sit down with a tax advisor and make sure you set it up correctly. The last thing you want to do is assume you have this wonderful tax advantage and then you set it up incorrectly and the whole thing becomes taxable. That's not good. All right. So term versus whole life. And then I'm going to question whether universal life is really permanent insurance. So term, you have renewable term. So you get to renew for a certain number of years. It doesn't mean your premium won't go up. Your premium can go up, but it can only go up because you aged another year. So they can't charge you more because you became sicker or less healthy, but they can charge you more because the entire group's getting older. So all they can do is look at the group and say, hey, this group, is what, this is what we charge them. You're in this group. We're going to charge you more. They can't specifically look at your health. So that's a renewable term. Most of us are not gonna have a renewable term, but I will say if your employer is providing life insurance, that's that's renewable term. It's a group policy, it is renewable term. The premiums are going up. You're just not paying it. Your employer is paying, paying for it. Level term, which is one of my favorite insurance, is you buy insurance and it's a fixed premium for whatever the term is. You can have 10 year level term, which is really popular, 20 year level term, which is very, very popular. And less popular now is 30 year term because they changed the rules on that, but 30 year term. Actually with 30 year term, they can't guarantee you 30 years without it changing. They, they may say that, that they, that's what they expect to do, but they can't actually guarantee that. But 10 year and 20 year term, yeah. If, if your premium is $50 a month, you know you're gonna pay $50 a month for that time period. Now we will talk about level term. If you buy level term, Oh, boy, I don't know the last 10 years, but when I was in the, in the field, uh, mortality was improving so much that insurance rates were just falling, falling, falling. And so if you had a 10-year level term and you were healthy five years later, you're probably better off going out and buying another level term policy. You get the extra five years, right? If you buy 10 years, then at the end of 10 years, you lose your insurance. But if you, after five years, you reprice it, you're picking up another five years. Y'all see that? You're just moving it out. But you might find that that $50 a month premium actually drops to 45. So you get the extra five years and your premium comes down if you're healthy. So you should really reprice. That happened for quite a while there where people were, mortality rates were just coming down. So level term, great, great policy, very simple. You know exactly what the premium is. There's no savings element. It's very straightforward. Convertible term, what this is, is usually it comes with your employer. It says, hey, you got a term policy, but you can convert it to a permanent without having to prove you're insurable. It's usually a horrible policy, mainly because the only people that convert are the unhealthy people. And so the conversion is usually not very, if you're healthy, you're not likely to take this policy. Industrial life, I've never worked for a company that sold industrial life. I'm not sure what, what this market is like now. It's really bizarre. I can't imagine it's much of a market anymore given the internet age. But industrial life is essentially funeral cost insurance. It's gonna be, a, you know, I don't know, a funeral cost today, five, 6,000 bucks, maybe 10,000, I don't, I don't really know. But it's just gonna cover those funeral costs. Very, really small face. 
it's it's going to look like the premiums are really low, but relative to how much insurance you're getting, it's actually quite expensive insurance. The premiums are usually collected weekly instead of monthly. It's designed for lower income people. It's it's a very expensive distribution system. It's kind of door by door, kind of a lot of handholding kind of thing. So it's expensive relative to what you're actually getting. If you can afford regular term, you're probably better off because it's just going to be expensive unless you just want to make sure you have your funeral costs covered uh, with your family. So I, don't, I really don't know what a funeral costs these days. And also don't know, you know, a lot of people are doing uh, cremation these days. I don't know what the cost of cremation is versus a funeral. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of options there. So uh, there are these plans that you may have seen them where the funeral homes actually sell these plans. Those are a little shaky because you don't really know if the funeral home is going to honor that or if they're even going to be in business. Uh, I'm not sure I'd be recommending that. Um, I did say the insurance company industry is the only one that can sell you something that depends on when you die, but those funeral policies might somewhat fit in that category. They probably are using some, some back stopped insurance company behind that. So I, I don't know anyone who buys industrial life. I have seen it. Uh, we'll look when we do the accounting, we'll look and see if the company we pick, I usually use Allstate. If they actually have industrial life, they may have a, a small, you know, 2% of a business might be that. One of my least favorite insurance is credit life insurance. So this is insurance that if you die, it's gonna pay off your debt. So if you have a mortgage or an auto loan, you're gonna pay off the debt. It's a rare form of decreasing term insurance. So your amount of coverage you get declines over time because you're paying down the debt. Usually sold when you do the mortgage. It's sold by the financial institution. I was on the credit union board once and we sold this stuff for our auto loans. And I, I just thought it was the most horrible insurance because it was just so ridiculously expensive. Very, very expensive. I don't know why people bought this stuff. Um, I think you're much better off just buying term insurance and then let your beneficiaries decide if they're gonna pay off your debt or not. I mean, take, take an example, you got a mortgage paying 5%, and interest rates are shot up to 9%, do you really want your beneficiaries to pay off that mortgage? Wouldn't they be better off taking the money, investing at 9% and just keep paying the mortgage at 5%? Then we get a, you know, why force them to pay off the debt? Let them have that choice of what makes more sense. So, but your, uh, your bank may not loan you money unless you have mortgage insurance, you know, it might be required. So the primary beneficiary is not your, your loved ones. The primary beneficiary is the lender. Um, and it constrains what the beneficiaries can do with the money. So, you know, for a lot of reasons, I don't like this. But when I was on the credit union board, I was like, why are we selling this? And the CEO of the credit union is because people keep asking for it. So we sell it to them. He's like, it's really horrible insurance. He's like, yeah, it's really horrible insurance. We have to sell it. Um, all right. What's the shortest term you can think of? What policy could you legitimately buy? So we talk about annual renewable term, that's one year. Could you go shorter than a year? Can you think of one that's shorter than a year? Could you buy a one month policy? Could you buy a one day policy? I told you there's a policy that's shorter than one day. Can you think about it? A perfectly legitimate policy. I'm not talking some you know alien insurance policy. Any takers? I've seen it sold and seen a kiosk selling it. Yeah, I don't have any. Um, so if you go, if you're flying somewhere, what kind of insurance could you buy? Flight insurance. If you're flying from San Antonio to Dallas, how long is that policy going to last? About 40 minutes. <laughs> so flight insurance is term insurance. I don't know how much it costs. It probably looks really cheap because you're only covered for 40 minutes. Maybe it's $3. Who knows? Do you need that insurance? I don't know. Buy If you need that insurance, you probably need life insurance. Uh, this is a big debate we had in my part B and C of auto insurance. People saying, well, what if you don't health, have health insurance? You better have Part B and C. It's like you're buying health insurance that only covers you if you're in an accident with an uninsured motorist. That doesn't sound like very good health insurance. Same thing here. 
well, I need life insurance. And what if I die on this flight? It's like, well, if you need life insurance, what if you die or you're driving your car or, you know, you need life insurance, you buy life insurance. Don't just buy it for this one thing. I haven't seen this lately. I remember in the airport, they would have the kiosk so you could buy flight insurance. Have y'all seen that at the airport? I haven't noticed them lately. But the San Antonio airport used to have a kiosk where you could buy flight insurance right before you took your flight. So that's about the shortest term you get. The longest term, I really think it's 30 years. You know, if you buy 60 year level term, you're essentially buying whole life insurance. So, you know, it's, I doubt that 60 years exists. All right, let's talk about whole life insurance. <clears throat> so if you see the word ordinary, very straightforward, you're paying the same premium every month until you die. Real straightforward. If you're 25, you pay it. If you're 75, you pay it. If you're 95, you pay it. Now it is possible they'll say, hey, if you make it to 100, stop paying the premium, we'll cover you for the rest of your life. And some of them might even say, hey, you make it 100, we'll just pay you the face of the policy because that's how it was priced. We assumed everybody died at 100. So you make it at 100, we'll just pay that. I don't know if the new mortality tables that go out to 115 and 120, if that's still the case. But essentially, you're going to pay the same premium, no changes, the same premium for your entire life. It does have a cash value to it. The cash value is going to grow over time. So when you start the policy, it might be zero. 10 years later, you may have $1,000 there. 20 years later, it might be $8,000. We'll, we'll look at that. And But it's priced so that if you make it to 100, that savings element, that cash value is going to exactly equal the face value of the policy. That's why they should just give you um, the proceeds, although there may be tax consequences of that. Very straightforward. The insurance industry says, who would buy that really boring policy? But that's why you should buy it. Really boring, very simple, very easy to understand type of policy. Let me pay very closely. But y'all see that word ordinary, very, very important. The word ordinary means you pay the premium until you die. Limit pay tells you you're going to pay the premium until some particular date. So if I give you a limit pay whole life on the second exam, I would have to tell you how long the limit pay is. Do you pay premiums for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, until age 65? You'd have to know that. That's the normal is you stop paying premiums when you retire, so age 65. So your premium is going to be higher because you're not paying as much premium, but then you get to stop paying premium at one particular time in the future. All right. These are both permanent insurance. I put universal life under permanent insurance because that's the way I've always thought it. And I no longer believe that. And I'll tell you why here. But this was introduced in 1979, just like what we talked about under the ethics of insurance, these discerning mediations. Insurance companies were losing a lot of business because of their whole life policies were paying really low interest rates, three, 4% interest rates, and people could buy CDs making 12, 13%. So the insurance industry developed this new product. Um, it was specifically to address disintermediation. Now, it didn't actually solve disintermediation. Essentially, what it is is it gave them a new product with high, where they could invest at the higher interest rates. It essentially let them start all over. So essentially, what they're doing is they're, they're losing whole life customers, but they're losing them to themselves. So people are getting out of whole life and buying universal life. So at least it was left pocket, right pocket. So they weren't, you know, crushing themselves. They're keeping the cash in house. Um, so what people were doing, they had a hundred thousand dollar whole life policy with a twenty thousand uh, dollar cash value. The whole life was paying three percent. The bank CD was paying eighteen percent. They would just take the cash value out, put it in the bank CD. And that all this cash was leaving the insurance company going over to the banks. So we already talked about this earlier. So the product didn't really solve that, but it did. What it definitely did is brought in complexity. So something you want to put in your notes on whole life. Whole life is a bundled product. These two are bundled products. By bundled, what that means is you have to pay the premium. If you stop paying the premium, your insurance is canceled and you lose your insurance coverage. So an unbundled product, what they do here is you get two premiums. One's for the insurance, one's for the savings element. 
you have to pay the insurance piece, but you don't have to pay the savings element. If you stop paying the insurance piece, the policy laps. But if you stop paying the savings element, your cash value just doesn't build up. So you have a cost of insurance and you have the savings element. So this is where this gets really, really tricky because the cost of insurance is going to move just like a renewable term. It's going to move every, every year you age. All right, so let me, let me show you why I hate universal life from personal experience. I should have brought the policy with me. Maybe I'll do that next class. I, I, wanted to I don't know if my mom would mad, mind me showing you this. It's a policy my mom, mom bought. So her premium, I don't remember the exact number, but I think her premium went from 250 to 1650 one month. Does that sound like whole life? Whole life insurance, if she paid 250, what would her premium be 20 years from now? 250, in 50 years, 250. So let's, how did this happen? This is universal life. She could have bought whole life ordinary home or life for the same policy and the premium probably would have been like 270. So what it costs her an extra $20 a month. But the nice thing is it would always be 270. She wouldn't have to worry about it. So how in the world does policy? All right. So there's a cost of insurance and there's the savings part. The savings is invested and paid a Crediting rate that changes monthly. All right, so they have the savings element and they have the cost of insurance. All right, so here's the key. Y'all you know, notice we're getting a little more complicated, aren't we? So the policy was priced such that the premium would always be 250, assuming what? Interest rates never changed. When in the last hundred years in the United States that interest rates never change? Doesn't happen very often, does it? And so what happened with this policy? Well, every year the COI goes up, but the savings element grows with the crediting rate. So the assumption is, how do you spell element? Oh, Bill Gates, there you go, E. All right, I think that looks strange. So the savings element grown. So what they say is, okay, so the cost of insurance is going up, but eventually that savings element is gonna be big enough to cover that higher cost of insurance and you won't even notice it. You'll just keep paying 270 and, and you'll, be, you'll be fine. You'll be able to cover, you'll be, essentially cover that yourself. So what, what happened was the credit rate fell dramatically, right? My mom bought this policy in the 90s when interest rates were six, seven, eight percent and they fell down to two, three percent. She wasn't getting that savings element. And so what happened was the premium she was paying was going up with the age of the insured. The insured was 80 something years old. You know, remember that graph just shoots up there. So the savings element just is not enough. So essentially what she was doing is she was taking money out of the savings element to cover that higher cost of insurance. And so the insurance company told her at some point, this 250 that you're paying will not be enough and the policy is going to lapse. And my mom kept telling me, yeah, they, they keep telling me that. I said, how much longer do you have? We kept looking at it. I am gonna to have to bring you, I'm gonna to have to bring you what they mailed me. You won't believe what they mailed me. Um, if you had a PhD in math and philosophy, you might be able to read what they sent me. It was pretty ridiculous. It was so complicated. Um, but this cost of insurance was growing month after month after month. And my mom's, the cash value was just shrinking, shrinking 10,000, 9,000. Eventually, the cash, the savings element, let me see if I can do it again here, fell 
to zero. So now it, it is all cost of insurance. What's the cost of insurance of someone who's 85 years old? It's massive. And so the cost of insurance is now 1650. You have no savings element. You have to pay the cost of insurance. She had no choice. Now think about this decision she had to make. She was paying two fifty a month. Now it goes to sixteen fifty, and that sixteen fifty is going to go to nineteen hundred, to twenty two hundred, to twenty five hundred. It's just going to keep growing as this person ages. So what decisions she had to make? So the policy is one hundred forty thousand dollars. 1650 a month, that's y'all can do the math. That's what 20,000 a year. <laughs> so, if this person lives another five, six years, you don't want this policy, you're going to throw all your money away. But if the person dies tomorrow, you're going to be really upset that you stopped the policy. That's a pretty anguishing decision to make about someone whose life you're insuring. So, you go talk to a person, hey, how much longer are you planning on living? The person that the life, I won't get into our details, but the life that was insured was someone whose health was really, really bad, but it had been bad for a long time and they just kept surviving. <laughs> they were our survivor. They like, no matter what hit them, they just kept, they kept surviving serious cancer. They got over that and survived it. Serious heart problems. There were times where they were telling us, I don't think I can make it another day. And then three years later, yeah, I feel pretty good. So we're trying to make that decision. So awful. And you almost think Murphy's Law, you stop the insurance and then they die immediately. You keep the insurance, they live another 20 years. That's a tough decision. What would happen if she bought this policy? So we're gonna be thinking about it. That's what I wish she had bought. That would have made a lot more sense. She said, well, it cost her an extra 10%. Yeah, but she knew for sure. So very, very painful. So is this permanent insurance? It's permanent insurance if interest rates never change. But if interest rates fall, you have something that was permanent insurance that suddenly becomes annual renewable term, which is a horrible policy to have. So what I did is I said, okay, mom, I'll pay the 1650. If the person doesn't pass away, I just have to eat that. If the person passes away, you'll pay me the premiums I paid out of the insurance proceeds and you'll get everything else. That was the deal we made. Uh, the person survived another two years and passed away. And so she reimbursed me that extra premium. Um, now, what else could we have done? We're going to talk about this later. Offset insurance. Um, we could have sold policy. So the face is $140,000. What was the savings element? Well, the zero, all right? So would someone buy this, this policy? Michael, you know the word biotical? Do y'all talk bioticals? Do y'all talk about them at work at all? Okay, so you know bioticals. They're not loved by the insurance industry, are they? they the insurance. But, would, would you want to just cancel the policy, get zero, or would you want to get something for it? So Viatical is a company that buys these policies. So they would have given me 40,000. So your options are let the policy expire, keep paying the 1650, or sell it to another company for 40. Which of those three would you kick out? How many would let it expire at zero? That doesn't make a lot of sense. So what is your real choice? My choice was a viatical or I keep paying the premiums. And Michael, as soon as I, I call some of our articles, guess what? I got a call from that company every single month. So he, they would ask me, hey, have you changed your mind? Now I've got this insurance on this person who's very sick. And I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, they'd love to have this policy for 40,000 because this person is likely to die in the next six months. Would you want to pay 40,000 for something? You're going to get 140,000 on the other side. You have to pay the premiums, right? They would have to pay the premiums, but they become the beneficiary on the other side. Would any of y'all want your parents making these kind of decisions? Isn't this just absolutely horrendous to do to anybody? 
Now, what did they actually tell this person? What they actually told this person was, here's the marketing. You'll pay $250 a month, but there's a good chance you can pay zero and still be insured. I know Yule doesn't have S's in it. So this is what they tell my mom. Hey, you know what? The premium's two fifty. But there's a good chance twenty years from now you can just pay a zero and you'll have you'll be fully insured. That's not what happened. So what does this assume? The two fifty was assuming interest rates never never fall. What what were they assuming here? Rates rise. Why did they tell my mom that? Hey, if rates rise, you won't have to pay anything. Why didn't they tell her, hey, if rates fall, you could see your premium go from 250 to 1650 a month? Do you think they should have told her both of those things? What do you think my mom would have done if they told her, hey, your premium could go up fivefold in one month? She probably said, Do you have anything else you can offer me? <laughs> Maybe you think she would have gone for the 270 in that scenario? Maybe so. But why did a salesperson only give this scenario and not give the other scenario? Commissions, right? The C word. So, um, I I was I actually tried to find a lawyer to sue this company because the sales rep accidentally left her sales stuff with my mom. She left it. My mom. She was supposed to take it with her, but she left. So I had all the stuff that she had. Um, I don't know, Michael. You know, you know what you know what this is called. It starts with a V. I don't know if they still use this vanishing premiums. You look, look up vanishing premiums with class action lawsuits and you'll see some major, major multi hundred million dollar lawsuits. This was a big deal when interest rates fell. People were told, hey, there's a good chance, you know, this premium will go to zero. You know, you'll pay 250 a month. There's a good chance to go to zero because, you know, we'll invest so well. We'll make so much money in your cash value. At some point, you can just stop paying premiums. You'll be covered for the rest of your life. The exact opposite happened. The premiums didn't vanish. Instead, they doubled and tripled and quadrupled. And major life insurance companies were getting sued left and right. I called a lawyer to see if we could sue. Unfortunately, once I figured all those was going out, it was way too late. All those lawsuits had happened a decade earlier, and we just... We, no one was interested in taking us up and the policy was too low. So we probably could have sued 10 years earlier, uh, but we didn't. And we would have noticed it because the cash value was dropping so fast, but my mom just wasn't, wasn't paying attention to that. So I think this, I used to like universal life as a decent policy. And maybe it's because I'm, I wasn't used to a period where interest rates just fell so fast that you know, this policy just came horrible. At this point, I, I, I wish she had just bought the whole life, simple, easy to understand, exactly what she needed. So why does she need this policy? Well, because when the person that the life was insured, when that person passed away, her income was gonna drop 80%. And so this life insurance was gonna make up for that lost income. It's pretty important she had this for the rest of her life, don't you think? Because she's more than likely outlived this person. So, and she has, she's lived an extra year five years so far. So am I saying euro is a horrible policy? Right now, it's probably not too bad because good chance interest rates are going to rise. So you're probably safer now than you were when she bought this policy. Um, yeah, so I, boy, not my favorite policy anymore. So premiums, the cash values, the level of protection can go up or down. Um, there's different ways you can structure it, but again, that gets into the complexity. Remember I said, as we go down this list, the complexity goes up. There's so many different ways you can handle this. It is the first unbundled product we had out there. So you only have to pay the cost of insurance, but if you don't pay the cost, if you don't pay the savings element, that cost of insurance is gonna rise as the person ages. So this isn't like level term. They're not like fixing the premium. It's a premium that goes up with the person's age. You can structure it so that the death benefit doesn't change over time, or you can structure it that you get the death benefit plus the cash value. But obviously that's gonna be much more expensive. 
Um, if you take out a policy loan, they're usually going to charge you a higher rate on the policy loan than they're paying you on the policy. So you're, you're penalized for that. That's another complexity. Um, so what happened with this policy? So ordinary whole life. Here's what that policy looked like, the advertisement. Here's the policy, here's your premium. Pretty simple. Universal Life, this is what it looked like. It didn't have the premium. What do you think was on the front of that policy? An interest rate. The world just radically changed. Big difference between saying, hey, buy this policy, pay 270 a month, and you get 140,000 if you die. Now here's the advertisement. You pay this policy, we pay 6%. Does it pay you 6% until you die? No, it pays you 6% this month. <laughs> what are they gonna pay you next month? Maybe 5%, maybe 7%. Have y'all heard of this phrase before? I'm always curious, Michael, what, what you're hearing at work, just in case I'm 20 years behind the time. Have y'all heard this before, bait and switch? What is bait and switch? Have you heard that phrase, Michael? Yeah, so there's one time in the year people really buy this stuff. That's when you pay 6%. And the next month you cut your rate to 4%. And you knew that was going to happen, but you didn't tell your salespeople that. That's real popular with TSAs. A TSA, Tailored Structured Annuity. Because who buys these? Teachers. When do you think the highest rate of the year is? Yeah, August, why is it the highest rate in August? Because that's when they're making their investment decisions. <laughs> so August, wow, we pay 6%. September, yeah, we pay 2%. <laughs> oh, wait, what happened? Bait and switch. Yeah, so there's some, some funny stuff going on. Um, you can't just look at the current rate. You got to look at other rates historically where they've been. It gets really complicated. Um, one thing I like about USA and some of its competitors USA had the, had the philosophy that they wanted to be in the top 25% at all times. So at least if you bought from them, you know, you, you wouldn't be the best, but at least in the top portal, quartile, that's, that's decent over time. That's probably going to give you a pretty decent rate. And the most, uh, maybe the highest integrity companies, they probably have that. They're not going to get way down in the pack. They're going to stay up there. Now, if the industry is paying 4%, and you got a company paying 6%, you know something's going on. It's not like they have some secret weapon they're buying investments. Everybody's buying the same thing. So if you're paying 6% and your competitors are paying 4%, you're losing money. You're not going to do that very long. So you're doing that just to get some business and then you're going to cut your rate pretty fast and probably cut it really low. So if your competitors are paying 5%, you'll pay 6%, get some business and you'll cut your rate to four. And you'll get your money back. Um, when is your sales reps really push the product? It's when you got that really high 6%. So it's, it's tough because you got the cost of insurance and you got the rate, but the universal life only sells on the rate. What if you're, well, we talked about this earlier. What if your cost of insurance is 200 bucks and the competitors is 150, but their rate's lower. They pay 5%, but the cost of insurance is 150. This company pays 6%, but the cost of insurance is 200. You now you got two moving parts. This 200 is going to change over time. This 150 is going to change over time. The 6% is going to change every month. The cost of insurance usually only changes annually. You're usually guaranteed 12 months without it changing. What kind of math do you need to compare those two products? It's very, very complicated. What about the owner hell life? Uh, I, I, that didn't change the title here. Ordinary hell life, how hard is this one? Very simple. 270, the rest of your life, you're done. Not hard to decide. What if your competitor charges 285? What do you do? You buy the 270, you're, you're done. Takes you three seconds to make your decision. You could go out and shop 10 different rates. 
if what would you do if you're trying to buy the find the best universal life policy? You have an Excel spreadsheet large enough to do that. You got to collect every single bell and whistle they have. It's it's a disaster. It really is a disaster. Now the cash value here is going to it's going to grow at a different rate, but you're probably buying this policy to collect the life insurance. You're probably planning on having it for your whole life. So you're probably not that worried about the cash value, but it, you will get different cash values from different companies. But most people are saying, I'm buying this for the life insurance. I want the cheapest rate. Yeah, the cash value might be higher or lower than the company, but I'm buying it for the life insurance. So, <clears throat> so complication. It's sold based on credit. I remember it. USA was just getting universal life when I joined. And I remember seeing that first marketing pamphlet and then this massive interest rate on the front. And I said, wow, that's kind of unusual. I've never seen that before. Um, all right, we, we talked about that. Um, so is this really permanent insurance if the credit rate falls so low that the cost of insurance eats up all the cash value. I would say it really isn't. It becomes just like my mom's policy. It eventually becomes an annual renewable term because she has no more cash value. All right, what are your questions to universal life? Still a pop popular product. It's still so, I don't know with interest rates so low, it may even be struggling right now, but it has been a very popular product. It was probably proper in the eighties and nineties because interest rates were so high. And it was a much better product, at least at initiation versus whole life. Would y'all buy universal life today? So my mom bought this policy. I'm her son. She has another son who was an actuary. Guess how many questions they asked us? Zero. They never talked to us. <laughs> she, had, she had a really good resources. She never came and talked to us about this at all. So... Uh, you know, talk to your parents. What are they buying? What are they doing? Um, they're probably not going to tell you they're, do they're doing insurance because they probably are scared they made a really stupid decision and they don't want you to think they're stupid. Are they stupid? They're not stupid. What's going on here? This stuff is complicated. But the sales rep talked to them like this is really simple stuff. And most of us, when someone says something really simple and it's really complicated, we're, we'll shake our heads like, yeah, yeah, I get that because we don't want to admit, we don't know what they're talking about. Your parents may be in that, so set them up. Have you talked to any life insurance agents recently? Uh, just you know, have that conversation and just see what's going on. Have your parents bought insurance on your lives? Have they given you those policies? What kind of policy do they buy? What's the premium? Are you gonna keep it in force? You know, there's probably stuff going on that you don't know about and you're gonna be shocked when you see it. All right, so can we make it more complicated? Definitely. So then they introduce a really, so remember when you see the word universal, what do you think? Universal, you associate that with unbundled. You now have two premiums, cost of insurance and the savings element, all right? Now we're gonna introduce a new word, variable. When you see the word variable, you start thinking dual regulation. You now have an insurance policy that is both an insurance policy and an investment. Regulators don't consider universal life to be an investment. They consider it to be life insurance. But when you see the word variable, when you see the word variable, you now have something that's both insurance and an investment product that the SEC is going to regulate. Why is that? Well, because with universal life, the, the insurance company buys the investments and they just pass on to you what they earn. If they buy a corporate bond yielding 7%, they're going to subtract your expenses. They're going to pay you 5% and you get 5%. But if that bond they buy goes insolvent, they bear all of that risk. All right. You don't bear that risk of that insolvency. Here, you are picking the investment and you bear 100% of that investment risk. If you put it in the stock market and the stock market falls 20%, your cash value is going to drop 20%, all right? So you're taking the direct investment risk here and you can put it in just about anything. You can put it in a bond fund, a stock fund, whatever. But whatever that fund does, it's going to go directly into to you. So what the SEC said, okay, insurance companies, 
we can see with universal life, you're still bearing a lot of that investment risk. So this really looks more like insurance, but with variable where you're letting the policyholder decide what risk to take, they're making investment decisions. We need a, an investment regulator involved. The insurance industry heard that and said, drop dead, we don't, we don't care. We're not subject to federal regulation. The um, US government took, took them to court, they won. And so the SEC now regulates these policies as well as the state insurance commission. So it's both regulated as an insurance product by the states and it's regulated as an investment by the federal government, which means if you sell this, you're gonna have, have, have to have two licenses. You, you have to be able to sell both of them because you're, you're now in a new world. Um, so you now have a bunch of new players in this business, but the premium is fixed. There's only one premium. There's not a cost of insurance and a savings element. This product is not very popular, not sold very much, but it's, it's a fixed premium, but the, this, the cash value part is just gonna go up and down, up and down. And you get dual fees. The insurance company is gonna have, get their, their spread, and then whatever fund you put your money into, they're gonna charge a premium as well. And these products are complicated. And I'll tell you how complicated they are. I had a, a, a friend of mine had one of these policies and I wanted to know what the mutual fund fees were. So I called the insurance company. I says, can you give me your management fees? I just want to know what they are for these policies. And the, the, the person on the phone said, oh, there are no management fees. So, yeah, I mean, for the mutual fund, underlying mutual funds, what are their fees? Oh, there aren't any. So I did the, um, you know, pretend like there was a, some problem with the phone lines. Sorry, sorry, hung up, called again, got a different person, and she sent me the management fees. But the person selling this had, <laughs> didn't know what I was talking about. So you're, you're giving me mutual, you're giving me fidelity mutual funds for free. There's no management. Yeah, yeah, there's no management fees. Yeah, I don't think that's true. Um, so yeah, it has another level of complexity and it has another level of fees. So the insurance company is taking its fees, the, the mutual fund is taking its fees. And then they put the two words together, variable universal life, which is what? It's variable life with what kind of premium? With an unbundled premium. And this is much more popular, much more popular here. This is where you can do variable universal life and Susie Orman, and you'll find a YouTube where she's bad mouthing. She doesn't like this policy. Why doesn't she like it? It really has to do with all the fees. You have so many layers of fees. It just, you're just overpaying, overpaying, overpaying. Where do you get the fees back? You get the fees back because of the tax treatment. So if the person dies and they get the money here, the stock market's really risen a bunch, essentially you can get all that investment gain tax-free. That's, that's a huge benefit but it takes several years for that tax benefit to offset all those higher fees. So it's, how long does it take? It depends on what the stock market does. It can take 15, 20, 30 years so that the stock market gains and those tax-free offsets the higher fees. But it is, it's fees on top of fees on top of fees, very, very expensive. Um, now USA used to have a variable universal life policy when I started. In fact, um, the lady who was doing the NAVs at the end of the day, she went out on maternity leave and she wanted to volunteer to strike the NAV. So I volunteered. I was just curious how to do it. Um, very interesting policy. To, you know, you strike an NAV every single day so the person knows how much that savings element is. It's going to go up and down with whatever the stock market's doing. Um, and USA had to stop selling it. Now, why would USA have trouble selling this product? So what do y'all know about USAA? No commission, but also they're a direct rider. What is a direct rider? They only sell by mail and the internet or by phone. So they don't have commission agents out there going door to door, door to door. Why would you have trouble selling this product if you don't have commission agents? Because they're really complicated products. It's hard to sell a complicated product if you're not sitting in someone's living room having tea and cookies and whatever. It's really tough. USA just found this policy was just too complicated for them to sell. And so what they did is um, 
They essentially bribed their policyholders to cancel the policy. They essentially paid them off, said, we got a deal, you can't refuse. <laughs> Here's your money back with a whole bunch of extra. So I would say, you know, if USA sells one of these again, you probably should buy it because it's not going to work out and they're going to have to bribe you to, to cancel it. And that's essentially what they did. They did variable annuities, the exact same thing. Didn't work out. They had to bribe the people to get them to take it away. And so, yeah, it's just tough to sell these policies. Um, I don't know if USA sells it today. I haven't looked. They felt like they had to sell it in the 80s and 90s because the stock market was doing so well and they needed something tied to the stock market, but they just couldn't get they couldn't get the, the volume for it to make sense. Um, I don't like this policy, but you know, if you're really convinced the stock market's going to take off, it is a very tax efficient way to own the stock market. Um, so it kind of it kind of depends on what you think the stock market's going to do. Endowment life, I actually kind of like this. So endowment life, it's a little bit different. Um, I'm going to show you a pure endowment life. Most people don't like pure endowment life, but endowment life, what it does is you buy this policy and if you die, you get the face. If it's a 10 year lot endowment life, if you die in the 10 years, you get the face of the policy. And at the end of 10 years, if you're still alive, you get the face of the policy. So whether you're dead or alive, you get the face of the policy. And people are saying, wow, this is great because if I die, I get the face of policy tax-free. And if I live, I get the face of the policy tax-free. This is like the best tax dodge there is. And IRS said, no, that you can't do that. Um, so they shut it down with the 1984 tax code. But I'm going to show you, I, I really like this. So a pure en endowment, what an pure endowment says, if you die, you don't get anything. But if you live, you get the face of the policy. I'm going to show you that. That I think that's a wonderful policy that the insurance industry refuses to sell, but it's a great policy. Um, so we'll, we'll definitely get back into this. And then you can't have a policy that's based on two lives. We're actually going to, we're going to price a joint life policy later in class. And the only reason I'm going to price it is like my little brother, who's an actuary, I said, hey, can I do a joint life policy in my insurance class? He says, no way, it's too complicated. So I just I decided to do one. So we're going to do a joint life policy. But a joint life, it can be first to die or second to die. <clears throat> first to die might be a policy where the one of the people, one of the spouses has a pension plan. But if they pass away, that pension plan goes away. And so what you want to do is say, hey, when, if that person passes, passes away, we need to have life insurance so that the other person, if they lose that pension, they at least have life insurance that can cover them. The second to die is if you have a big estate and you need something to help fund all the estate costs and estate taxes, you don't need that the first person dies because when the first person dies, that estate all goes to the spouse tax-free. So you don't need it there, but the second person dies, you need something to pay it. So, you know, it kind of depends, first to die, second to die. Um, so you have two lives that this is based on. Um, and we're gonna price this because it's an interesting policy because you have to look at the probability of both people dying or one person dying, the other not dying. It depends if it's first to die or second to die, what kind of policy is. We're going to price a first to die policy because it's a little simpler to do. Um, and we'll, we'll see how, how that makes sense. The big question here on the first to die is should, should you buy a first to die policy or should you just buy two term policies? And we're going to see when you're young, in your 20s or 30s, you, just, you should just buy the two term policies. There's no reason to buy the joint policy. But once you get to be about 60 or 70, you know, it can make a big difference which of these policies you buy. So we'll see that. We'll actually calculate, do the math, and I'll show you the difference in those. And there's all types of variations. So on the second exam, I'm going to give you a bunch of normal policies to price. You're going to price them. You're going to do really well on it. All previous classes have it. It looks complicated, the first three or four that we do. And then you can go, oh, I get it. That's simple, pretty easy. I got to do this for the actuaries so they can see how we do mortality tables. It's pretty straightforward. And then I'm going to give you this ridiculous policy that makes no sense whatsoever, just to see if you can you can handle the math. So I'll, I'll show you several examples of one. Uh, maybe I'll show you one now so I can freak you out, but you won't do this until the second exam. It's way down in the notes. 
มีความละเอียดเ o n g e v i t y Life Company developed the product. It's issued to pay 60. You pay for premium up front of 49.55. At age 95, it starts paying 1.7 million at the beginning of each year and charges an annual premium at the beginning of each year, so they're still alive. Calculate the net premium. It starts to charge at age 97 in addition to the initial premium. Did y'all do that right now? Probably not. If you can, why are you taking this class? But But by the time the semester ends, you'll be able to do this with no problem. All right, so that's pretty exciting, right? So, um, so on the exam, we're going to be pricing all of these policies, and I'm going to give you a crazy one. The crazy one I'm going to give you is actually using one of my my um, longevity policies that I really like because I think the numbers are so shocking. You can say, "Wait, this insurance can pay me that much money for that small of a premium?" I just think it's it's amazing. So I want to kind of show that to you. All right, so they can actuaries can do anything. All they need is a mortality table, some assumption on interest rates. They can put anything together. They you can put together. Now, the one other thing they have to take advantage, they have to consider that we're completely ignoring is lapses. So insurance policies are very expensive to set up because they have to do. Drug tests and blood tests, and so they actuaries have to assume, okay, I got this 10 y e a r policy, but there's some percentage that are going to cancel it after one year, and I'm going to lose a lot of money on them because I, I but then there's some that can keep it longer. So the lapse is the part we're going to ignore. So we're just going to do the the pure premium. We're not going to do the the full loaded premium. So the actuaries you have to consider that. So policies where they have high lapse rates, they're going to charge a whole lot more because. They're not making as much money over the life, so we're ignoring that one element. But other than that, we're doing we're going to do what actuaries do. Um, okay, let me check something real quick. Okay, I'm sharing. Okay, I just make sure I was sharing. Hopefully, I'm sharing the right thing, and then it doesn't, it won't bring it back. Come on, you can do it. All right. Life insurance policies can also be participating policies. So, participating policy or PAR policies. What it is, you buy insurance, and the insurance company is going to intentionally overcharge you. And the reason they're intentionally overcharging you is it just makes the policy much safer for them, so they don't have to hold as much net worth, makes it more profitable for them. But what they say is, hey, we're going to overcharge you fifteen dollars a month. But then, if 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 we don't really need that, we're going to pay it back to you as a dividend in the future, and you'll get that dividend tax free. It's kind of nice. So you know, let us overcharge you. We'll invest it. We'll make extra money, and you'll essentially get that money back tax free anyway. Trust us; it's a good deal. Um, so they might say, you know what? We think this many people are going to die. But we'll charge that many people plus five percent. We'll assume an extra five percent die. But after 10 y e a r s maybe only 95% of those people die. So we actually do better. We're going to figure that out. We're going to give you that excess. We're not going to keep it. We're going to give it to you. Now that they have to give it to you, no, they could keep it all they wanted to. But it's just the design. Or maybe that thought, you know, we're going to. This is how much expenses we're going to have. But if our expenses come in below that, we'll give you whatever we didn't have to pay. Are the investment earnings? You know, we thought we we're going to make five percent. We actually made five point three percent. We're going to give you that extra. Now, do insurance companies actually give you the extra? Yeah, they do because that's part of the competitiveness of the product. I remember the guy who did the PAR policies at USAA, and he he owned. He was an actuary. He owned that policy. Hey, we should be giving them a fifty dollar dividend. That's what they earned. That's what we priced, and he set up the policy like that. And if anyone debated with him, he's like, "No, this is a participating policy. Our mortality rate is here. Our expenses are here. Our earnings are here. We owe them 50 bucks." I don't know if every company is like that, but that's the way he was. He he was like an advocate for that for that PAR policy. Now, I went with my brother to an insurance company. We're going to talk about a bit later. Let me tell you what they told him, so I can stay on my bandwagon about how bad this industry is. 
we don't need a hundred font. But their argument was all par policies are a rip off. He said, if you buy a par policy, you're being ripped off. My brother had, he had a state farm life par policy. And they were telling him it's a rip off. Why? Because look, we have an article written by someone. So that was their argument. We have this article that says par policies are rip off. So obviously that proves to you that par policies are a rip off. And that's all the evidence they have. Somebody wrote this article and said par policies are rip off. So here's, here's what we had. He had a 10 year level term par policy from State Farm that charged $75 a month. And they said, get rid of it and buy our non par policy for $125 a month. Same face. Everything's the same except for two things. What's the two things that are different? The State Farm was participating and the State Farm was 75. Theirs is non-par and their premium was 125. And their argument was our policy is better because someone wrote this article. They also said this par policy has never paid a premium. So see, we told you. The State Farm policy has never paid a premium. It could pay a premium. So what's the worst case scenario for my brother with this product? He pays $75 for 10 years and never gets a dividend. What's his worst case with this policy? He pays $125 a month and that's all he's going to get. Could this one be better? He could pay $75 and he could get a premium. Could this one be any better? No, that's the best he's going to do. Can anyone understand their argument to my brother? <laughs> they, with a faith, with a straight face, this is what they told my brother. I, I was about, I, mean, I think my brother was going to have to take me out on the gurney. It was like, I was having a heart attack. I, I wish I had videotape, video that, that don't y'all wish I could show y'all that video? You want to just see my my veins coming out of my forehead. I was so irately mad. This was a double A rated company. This was a single A rated company. So from a credit quality, State Farm was higher credit quality. So from you couldn't argue that, hey, you know, we're more likely to be there for you. So they with a straight face told my brother he should cancel that policy and buy their policy. Pretty crazy stuff. And this was their entire argument. So I agree, State is unlikely Stark Farmer is actually going to pay him a dividend on level term. Music par policies are permanent insurance, and there they do tend to pay dividends. But level term, if you buy a level term par policy, there's a good chance you'll never get a dividend, but it's possible. So you know your worst case is this. There is a better case where you get a dividend. So that's the argument. Uh, crazy argument. Uh, but the downside of participating policies is that it does add another level of complexity. So if I had switched these, that this one charged 130 a month and this one charged 125, now it gets a little complicated. Because then you say, well, I'm paying 130, but I could get some of my money back. Of course, in front brother, that wasn't, that wasn't his issue. He, it was pretty obvious in this case what he should do. He, he made the right decision. He had the right company, the right policy. Um, made perfect sense. But it does add, that makes comparison shopping extremely difficult. All right, so, um, all right, I want to start this. What we're going to do, uh, I'm going to bring up this guy, Art Williams. What company did Art Williams start? Anybody know? Someone was asking me about it last class. Maria was asking me about it last class. You can Google him. So he started a com company called Primerica. Have y'all heard of Primerica? So anybody here work for Primerica? My, my high school government teacher did. So we're gonna talk about it now. The way I did this, 
Art Williams' argument was buy term, don't buy perm, and invest the difference. So I'm gonna talk what his arguments were. And then there's a textbook I have used in this class, but I haven't used it in 20 something years. The author of that book on life insurance was so biased in favor of perm that I took his arguments for a perm. So these are very biased arguments. I took someone who was very biased toward term and I got their arguments. I took someone who was very biased toward perm and took their arguments. Some of the arguments are just offsetting. I didn't, this is gonna be a question on the exam, but I didn't organize it for you. So you're gonna have to take, I simply just took the arguments from two sources and put them out there. You're gonna to have to sit down and organize them, okay? I didn't write the answer for you because I don't wanna read my own answer. All right, so it is a little bit convoluted. Um, I'm going to tell you that I like Art Williams' argument, but I don't like his products, <laughs> all right? Because he sold really expensive term insurance and sold really what I thought were really bad investment products. Now, I'm thinking about Prime America several years ago. It could be a very different company today. So I've been out of the business for, for a long time. So it might be a great because Travelers bought them and then City bought Citibank bought Travelers. It's possible that whole transaction cleaned up Prime America before they got spun off. I really don't know. I haven't looked at it in a while. But if you ever buy their products, you definitely want to compare premiums. Because their premiums, at the time they were selling to my brother, their premiums were significantly higher than competition. And so, so that's where we're going. Before we do that, though, I want to talk about, is there a way we can compare these complicated products? And I'm going to show you how the industry tries to do it. It's not foolproof. It's still complicated, but there is a way to do this. So we'll start there next time. So hopefully your paper is going well. If anyone wants to talk about your paper next week, let me know. Get them done. Get them out of the way. 